Thank you so much for the introduction. Thank you so much for the invitation to come out. It's a great pleasure to be here. It's been very enlightening. Uh, so I'd like to uh, give a quick overview of uh, one of the research endeavors we've been running at UC San Diego for a while, which is the Center of Interdisciplinary Science for Art, Architecture, and Archaeology, which over the years has worked with SciArc, actually uh, even had uh, some of its uh, employees as PhD students uh, throughout the years. And uh, the vision always has been, well, how do we really move about creating a future for the past, right? How do we take these great digital archives that are being created today, and how do we now elevate uh, the game uh, to the next level, right? How do we use it to fully understand our, our cultural heritage, our cultural patrimony, and how do we develop strategies for preserving it? So the Caesar III uh, vision really was how do we go about creating a unified methodology for cultural heritage diagnostic? How do we go about imaging right, our cultural heritage sites today? Right? How do we do this really ser seriously anchored in science and engineering? So by the end of the day, we can trust the data that has been acquired, has been archived, and is being wor worked with. And how do we really go about adding the tools, uh, the techniques, uh, the methodologies to make all of that happen while really working in the field. And that's really hard for somebody in academics, right? We like to work in clean rooms, right? Beautifully uh, confined environments uh, where you can develop wonderful theories. But once you start taking those theories into the field, uh, theory and practice are hugely different, right? So 95% of the work actually happens in the field. Uh, so it becomes very exciting on the other hand. So techniques, uh, technology and tools uh, really as an enabler for discovery, for innovation. And doing this really on site, in situ, uh, wherever possible. But generating information from it, which is both persistent, uh, pervasive, and at the end of the day, persuasive, right? We can convince folks that this really does matter, and that's why this uh, SIAC uh, 500 effort is uh, so amazing. So since uh, we are from academia, uh, of course, education is close to our heart. So how do we go about cultural heritage diagnostics as a profession, right? Can we really educate the cultural heritage engineers, cultural heritage scientists of the future? And uh, thanks to support through the National Science Foundation, we were able to create an integrative graduate research, education, and traineeship program, really looking at how to bring very diverse teams of students that uh, come from three different schools, 10 different departments uh, right now to work together to tackle tough challenges using, on one hand, a one-of-a-kind curriculum to inform, uh, to, uh, to set the ground stage, but really take the world as our uh, field school uh, to move forward. And using hands-on, of course, training wherever possible. At the same time, uh, our future stars, right, the future engineers, our future leaders become what I would call archaeo-diplomats. Folks that really can excel in archaeo diplomacy, right? You have seen the doors that can be opened once we connect to somebody's cultural heritage, regardless of where we go, how dark the times are at a particular place. Somebody somewhere will be able to relate to their history, to their past, and be proud of it, right? There's a starting point uh, to open doors, and it's quite amazing, right, what can be achieved at that level. So here's just the group of 21 PhD students that we have right now working on this. They're backed up uh, by another 50 undergraduate students that come out of a National Geographic Society UCSD Engineers for Exploration program, developing next generation technologies for explorers. We're also very lucky to have five National Geographic explorers on our team, another three or four collaborating uh, on different projects. So Caesar three initially said, okay, we have art, architecture, archeology, span it's the end, science and engineering is becoming the glue to pull all of this together. And as I indicated earlier, in order to make this happen, we cannot just live in our own ivory towers anymore, in our own specific disciplines. We need to go beyond uh, many disciplines to make this happen. So have computer scientists, material scientists, structural engineers, work with physicists, with chemists, with art, art historians, with anthropologists, archeologists. And that is creating a habitat that is truly transforming, both for the academic landscape, but also what we can achieve. Now, in order for all of that to work, right, we need this cultural heritage methodology, the driver that takes us forward. And acquisition, of course, has been a central point for the last two days here. 
uh, of discussion. So how do we uh, digitally archive, digitally collect uh, information that is out there using diagnostic imaging tools that cover the entire electromagnetic spectrum. So we have heard a lot about LIDAR, right, using either uh, infrared or UV type technology. We have a lot, a lot about photography, but there's so much more in the electromagnetic spectrum to characterize artifacts at the surface. That is great, that's the starting point, and that's where Iron Mountain now gets excited. What we really need is subsurface and volumetric, right? To ac acquire this room at the surface is a great starting point. It shows me what it looks like today. What we really want to do is to model and then predictively simulate how this structure will perform under an earthquake. What would happen under uh, severe wind load and so on, natural disasters or even human-made disasters, right? So we need to add quite a bit multiple orders of magnitude, more information towards really capturing the geometry, right? The next thing we, of course, need to do is uh, analytical diagnostics. Geometry is fine, but we really need to know the materials. Uh, is this wood frame? Is this brick? Masonry? Whatever it is, right? We need to know the materials to really come up with a conclusive model that we then can plug into our archives on one hand, but also plug in our computational engines that can say, okay, given a particular disaster scenario, let's go ahead and forward predict what will happen. Given just day-to-day -day life, right, and that uh, natural uh, decay of our infrastructure, go ahead and predict what will happen. And the tendency has always been, well, these artifacts have been around a thousand years. Why should we care, right? Uh, why should we act now? We have another thousand years, so it shouldn't be our generation having to do this. And that, of course, has been, for most of us, <laughs> a, qu a quite shocking approach. That, well, let's, let's really understand the artifacts out there creates the equivalent of a digital clinical chart, right, that captures their state of health. And with that, then we can move forward and say, okay, here's the right approach towards preserving these artifacts into the future or restoring them properly so we actually do more good uh, than harm in the process. Of course, data storage, right, critical enabler, proper geospatial mapping, entering or uh, anchoring data in space, globally, and time becomes very important, but then also data augmentation. How do we now enhance that story through other published records, through other documentation that has been going on, and how do we generate these community databases in the end that we can broadly access, right? So then we have analysis, and that's the huge opportunity that will spring, of course, from the SciArc 500 challenge as well. Once all of this data is there, that's wonderful, but what do we do next, right? How do we get the public to engage? How do we de get the stakeholders to engage with their data? Uh, how do we really use it for the domain specialists to change the state of knowledge, right? So we need to do, look at modeling, we need to look at visualization, uh, techniques that we call visual analytics to read the data. How do we get the public at large or crowd sourcing campaigns to add additional data, but also help us interpret, read it, because there's simply too much of it right now before we can come up with techniques to actually automate some of it. Uh, how do we do the 3D visualization how do we do cultural analytics? And at the end of the day, how do we disseminate it, right? Traditional print might not excite us too much. How do we do it through open access formats or forums? How do we do 3D printing, right? Bringing these artifacts back to, li back to life as a whole, reconstructing them or even repairing them through some of these techniques. And how do we always uh, pull back citizen science, right, into the envelope? Now, all of this has to ideally go in lockstep, right? Acquisition, curation, analysis, and dissemination. And be a self-feeding prophecy of sorts, right? It continues, ad finitum, right? Again, generating fantastic data amounts, and hopefully, as we move forward, many new insights that we haven't dared to dream about. Now, if you just look at some of the diagnostic imaging techniques beyond uh, the LIDAR and photogrammetry, that we've heard about uh, so far, right? We have synthetic aperture radar for airborne platforms. We have ground penetrating radar to actually peek into the ground, into walls. Um, uh, the microwave imaging for similar techniques for walls, infrared that tells us something about uh, the thermal uh, signature or even carbon content of particular materials. Uh, reflective transformation imaging, which actually allows us to later on relight entire spaces, right? Re-illuminate how a particular edging might have looked uh, under particular conditions, and so on and so on, right? So there are many different techniques that all now come into uh, fruition. Uh, we apply pretty much every single one of them uh, at one level or the other. So this is a very long list. It's an exciting one. There's lots of fundamental work that can go on and is going on in imaging, but in the end, it builds so much more empower 
the data and the value of the data that we are uh, capturing today. So this page right now really lists many of the volumetric imaging techniques that we are working with right now and that we are helping to invent to some extent, including muon tomography, which actually allows us to image massive structures and cross sections uh, of them, right? We get to play with nice tools, as you see, those of you that have grown up with Star Trek, we actually have our own right, blasters uh, of sorts. This is actually an X-ray fluorescence uh, imaging device which allows us to characterize materials, among others. Now, with all these great tools and gadgets coming to fruition, um, we were working with Tom Levy since 2005, who historically has been a dirt archaeologist uh, out of UC San Diego, and he reinvented himself to become a digital archaeologist and now a cyber archaeologist. So the vision was, wh what should the archaeology or the um, big site of the future look like, right? Uh, so in this case, well, we might have our traditional LiDAR scanners, wherever they come from. We might have traditional surveying equipment or a total station and so on. But they rapidly now get uh, uh, augmented by airborne systems and particular balloons have, and blimps have turned out to be particularly powerful since they can stay airborne all day, acquire the entire excavation process, which is inherently destructive, right? Our archaeologist friends obliterate these sites. They leave the artifacts intact, but the site itself has been forever changed, can never be recaptured again. So if you can document the process of excavation, we can actually build 3D models of the entire site, what the artifacts look like that were excavated, maybe the walls, the ruins, uh, where artifacts were found and recomposited digitally in 3D space and in time, right? So balloons, uh, drones, quite powerful. Uh, tablet augmented reality applications to actually read uh, that data. And David Vannoni has an example set upstairs that you can check out uh, during the lunch breaks. But most of all, how do we then take other techniques such as XRF, F-tier imaging to characterize materials, combine all of it with 3D models, maybe even acquired of smaller artifact, artifacts at extremely high resolution, push it into virtual 3D environments that allow us to literally step digitally into our excavation site without having to deal with dust and heat and scorpions, uh, mosquitoes, whatever else gets in the way, uh, local chaos, and uh, focus on the data analytics, right? How do we create these front ends? At the end of the day, what this is all about, creating these layered realities where the LiDAR data and photogra photography data is one first step. There's, of course, the satellite images. There are the multispectral image layers that tell different parts of the story. And only if you bring them all together, you really get the big picture. And the big picture is really what we are after. Then there might be textual layers, annotations, but then there's also the community, which has a tremendous wealth of information. And all of this, right, we would like to get into these data archives to tell the whole story, but most of all, get as many of us, everybody out there involved, right, in the process of creating it, taking ownership of it, becoming stewards of these uh, environments. So, right, uh, once this is all in place, then it, of course, becomes much more straightforward to tell the story. And storytelling, right, scientifically or otherwise, is a fantastic thing, doing it in museums, at archaeological sites or elsewhere, and we just heard about uh, these replicas. Um, phantoms, we would sometimes call it in the imaging world, right, can we uh, recapture and recommunicate digitally and physically. Now, if we very quickly look at what innovations have taken place in the last 20 years, right? So engineers and scientists have made sensing, the process of acquiring data, somewhat easy, right? Uh, there's diagnostic imaging, there's analytical diagnostics, there's, of course, a tremendous um, uh, speed towards coming up with new technologies. There's this ever exponential growth of data, the data avalanche, literally that's coming at us, but sensing has gotten and has gotten much more easy. Uh, computer engineers have made computing easy, right? At home, uh, uh, and at the industry level, uh, globally, uh, through the cloud, right? Connected, so commuting, computing and getting access to unbelievable uh, computing capabilities is a click away, right, to all of us. So, so Amazon, cloud services or elsewhere. So network engineers have made networks uh, fairly easy, so locally, regionally, and globally. And from our research back end, we are actually connecting with the world with a close to 100 gigabit as of last week, right? And that completely transforms how we can collaborate, how we can share data, 
how we can operate. The world becomes a much smaller place on one hand, right? You're just uh, a speed of light <laughs> instance away from anybody else, but it also, also allows us to share information much more quickly and in much more richer form. And then computer scientists and artists have really helped us to represent data visually in ways that are compelling, intriguing, engaging in 2D, 3D, in high definition, 4K digital, sim digital cinema and far, far beyond. And doing so in monoscopic, so 2D, but most of all stereoscopic, immersive 3D vision. Now there's a big problem that is still there, right? Getting from all that big data, these wonderful data assets being curated right now, to the decision. That's insanely hard. So how do I take this data and right now say, for this particular site, during the next earthquake, does this collapse? Yes, no. If I don't do anything about this crack that has developed in the cupola, if I don't retrofit it, will this still stand next year? Yes, no. Right? These binary questions are so hard. But how do we get there? How do we take big data, get to information, extract an understanding of a particular artifact, a site of it? How do we then turn it into knowledge that then helps inform a strategy to be developed and then helps us to make decisions? Right? And that's a challenge to all of us right now. So Ben and Barbara are doing a great step, right? Provi providing you with all the data right? that's needed uh, uh, to move there, or the first layer, right, of this data. But how do we take the next big step? And one area we are very excited about is data analysis and visual or cultural analytics. And what we mean by this is to really enable analytical reasoning through means of interactive visualization. To take this data, surf it up in the most intuitive way, visually, through audio, through haptics, or otherwise, allowing you to step into it and start exploring it, and to really draw from the best motor purpose processor in the world, your brain, right, in regards to analyzing it, so detecting patterns, detecting correlations, right, uh, to really enable the discovery of the expected while also finding the unexpected at the same time in many cases, and moving beyond the status quo. And the status quo right now, as powerful as the internet is, right, we can point everybody at any of the archives that exist, we can look at this data, it gives us a many brains, a, a many eyes approach, right, we can look at it. What we really need to get to is connect our brains. All of us very uniquely interpret the data that's out there. Let's make this happen, right? So how do we get all of us together at the same time to collaborate on these types of projects and turn this into a game changer? So here's an example of the MedArcNet uh, work that um, uh, Tom Levy has been doing, synthesizing essentially Google Earth type content with scanned information in the field. So can we geospatially and temporally uh, reference information? Uh, so let's take us down uh, to the particular excavation site in Treben Nahas, I think, of Ayan. Uh, pull up one of the artifacts which has been found, be able to explore it, analyze it uh, in real time, right? The content is already there. We should be able to fetch this right now from your uh, archive, but then also georeference it properly with the target site. Now that still is a many eyes approach. What we really need for the many brains approach are net new uh, visualization environments that can scale very big to support teams, as we have it here, uh, to sites that are individual, that individual users will uh, work in, but that are heavily networked and connecting us that way. So we're looking at display environments that cover entire rooms, entire surfaces that literally mimic or define uh, the holodeck uh, of the future, and doing that in 2D and 3D, but also combining different personal devices with the experience we get to custom data served up to you. So m imagine standing or moving into your movieplex, your digital cinema, but rather than watching a preferred movie, you actually get to interact with Leonardo's adoration of the Magi. And by, simply, by the simple act of moving towards the canvas, towards the screen in this case, the entire representation will change, going from the visible range to infrared, from the pigment that we see today to the underdrawing that Leonardo da Vinci last saw before the pigment was applied, right? And the amazing, most amazing things happen, the entire iconography and iconology that has been interpreted for the past 500 years gets turned upside down, right? Can we create these experiences uh, through visualization? But also can we co-locate different data assets, right, at the comfort of your home uh, of sorts, right, in a protective environment that really makes it better than many cases being there, but being able to co-locate 
different, many different data mod modalities with the particular data assets that you're studying. Doing it at resolutions that in the field, right, with our limited field of view, would be impossible, right? With superhuman vision of sorts, where everything is in focus, where you get to appreciate um, your artifacts, in this case, the hieroglyphs, uh, at a level that many of us coming back from this field that we did not even realize, right? How deep these were incised, right? Can we do this in teams? Can we do this interactively? Can we even do it in group settings, right? Whatever that means, more conventional settings uh, or folks uh, really interacting. But most of all, can we get us back into the context, back into uh, the data for exploration, going to places that may or may not be made, personally might not be able to go, but others might that are either on the ground or have the privilege of going there, or right, mediated through devices, uh, bring other places to us, in this case, this data from the Mars rover, right? Literally going uh, where nobody has gone before at different scales, right? So that opens up then for us again, <laughs> exciting research challenges. If you look at the SIAC 500, now that uh, probably billions of points already in the archive, trillions of points are not far away. All of the software that you have today falls apart. It's a tens of millions, maybe hundreds of millions points of points. So it becomes difficult, right, to really analyze that data at its fullest potential uh, unless we do something about it. And so Vit Petrovic, who's also showing some work upstairs, maybe even in here over the break, uh, has developed a set of new algorithms that really allow us to scale our visualizations to tens of billions of points interactively. So we can step in, hand a game controller to a six-year-old who will perfectly explore that space, by the way, right? Many of us will struggle, but that six-year-old, no problem. Uh, to go to places, right, that otherwise he or she will not be able to go and take in all of the rich content. So how do we really drive data sets? And here's one, a 1.5 billion point data set uh, sampled at millimeter, super sampled millimeter point to point spacing for the Hall of the 500 at Palazzo Vecchio. We almost get, in Florence, Italy, we almost get photorealistic uh, resolution for the frescoes on the side work by Giorgio Vasari in a space that's also believed to host uh, Leonardo da Vinci's greatest masterpiece, uh, Battle of Angiari, which went missing in 1560, right? So how do we do this? Uh, uh, really put ourselves uh, back into these data sets uh, in a way where we can actually interact with it. I think there were some codec issues here, uh, through a regular uh, game control, right? How do we bring photorealistic content back home? That might be a living room, by the way, right? Uh, to connect uh, to the domain experts and to uh, connect to those uh, that really make decisions in the future, the public at large. So I said, okay, this is a great start. We can do this in large scale and collaboratively. Uh, the nerds in us said, okay, we really need that holodeck. So we ended up building it right, many years ago, uh, called the Star Cave, a multi-sided projection uh, environment. You literally step in, you close the door behind you, and everything is digital content in 3D, spatialized sound, um, uh, so you literally can hear the wind right, whistle around your head, the uh, uh, sand crunch under your feet as you're exploring a particular target site, right? But now we can do contextualized visualization. We can step into these spaces. It's not a PowerPoint slide anymore. It's not a photo. It's not a 3D model landing on a laptop screen, right? Which is already great advancement over everything we have. But right now we really can hop into these spaces uh, and explore them, and we can do this across uh, different sites. So here's Tom Levy, our archaeologist, standing in the sites that we built at uh, for the uh, King Abdullah University for Science and Technology in Saudi Arabia. But we can connect these spaces now and literally con collaborate uh, across long, ven uh, long distances. Now we said, well, these custom-built spaces might be a little bit budget-constraining. Can we do better, right? It's the price of a sedan and build essentially a bridge for you that can be taken anywhere to a conference, to a workshop, uh, 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 to the local stake stakeholders uh, to explore these settings. And again, this works wonderfully with off-the-shelf components that we literally can buy at our preferred uh, electronics uh, store, uh, assemble, drive through our software layer, and then render these massive uh, data collections. So he said, well, we're living in California, there's always great surf, waves are everywhere, many of our students are surfing. 
we needed to have a wave nearby. So we ended up designing the wide angle virtual environment called wave, uh, which uh, from a conceptual perspective gives you 180 degree field of view. So you literally can hang over a railing that we put in place for tourism type uh, venues or museums, but then look right up and be fully immersed with a big field of view. Again, taking this a step further at a budget uh, that's actually possible for museums, but also at the design level where displays become field deployable within minutes. So uh, the wavelet component, the subcomponent of that bigger display I just showed you, actually fits into a roadshow case. The same roadshow case is used by the Rolling Stones, so that's always a good starting point. And uh, so we can take these into the field. We just had um, uh, SIARC data uh, at Hexagon showing on one of our wavelets immersively in Las Vegas. Uh, to demonstrate the fact, right? We can field deploy, drop ship that technology to where it needs to be to have the highest uh, possible um, impact. Now, oops. Oops. that's one step. Uh, how do we get us engaged again, right? Become the explorers, become the Indiana Jones, right? That we all want to be, one way or the other. So multi-touch surfaces, uh, the tablets, the iPhones, but tablet surface in general are very powerful uh, design. So here's an example, oops, let me turn this off, um, of a uh, motor touch surface connected to an iPad. You can bring up your data, you can start interacting with it, overlay different data layers, wipe away pigment, look at the underdrawing, wipe away the entire canvas, look at the scaffold, uh, the actual canvas out of wood, the uh, reinforcements and so on behind it understand a painting, but explore it on your own terms, right? I mean, museum directors will go screaming when you step past that rope, but now you want to go and do a scratch it type example, right? Let's peel away some paint and see what's behind it, right? Through technology, we now can do this. We can do it collaboratively. We can connect different devices. So in this case, we're actually wiping away uh, the pigment, look at the underdrawing, the very beautiful, very crisp masterpieces that uh, Da Vinci uh, created, many of which we don't see today because they're hidden uh, by pigment, right? But it's up in our hands to explore it. We give this to any 10-year-old and their eyes will light up, right? They will get engaged, uh, really work with this. Uh, rather than walking in a museum, the eyes glaze over and they look for the next gelato stop, right? When they're in Italy. <laughs> My kids got really good at finding gelato, the best gelato places in Florence by enumerating natural or historic landmarks. So that, again, was a great uh, learning experience there. Yeah? It's all about motivation, so I can tell you every single landmark that is, as long as it leads to a gelato place. Uh, right, so it's a question of how do we <coughs> compel right, adoption. So how do we put that technology into everybody's hand? And all of us, I believe, pretty much everyone here has a smart device, motor touch capable, uh, video camera for see-through type augmented uh, reality application, so we can capture the real world through the camera uh, back facing uh, in our device, see the world through that device, overlay other content in real time, and explore it, uh, the real world, in ways we never could before. But we can do this with our personal uh, device, which is so important. So here's an example of David Vanoni, who's showing the same thing upstairs in the Hall of the 500 in Florence, Italy. So we have more than spectral image data for that space. Now he just froze, uh, just uh, recorded that space. So now he goes in and wipes away the visible range that he just acquired and superimposes thermal image data, the heat signature. And what he starts to see and reveal are hidden windows, hidden passageways that existed in that space, uh, cracks that exist in the wall that otherwise went unnoticed and might jeopardize uh, the frescoes on the wall, right? So these become game, game changers, but they can be accessible to all of us. Imagine how we can tell a story now in all these great spaces are being recorded by really augmenting uh, what is there. So even if you physically now go there, right, you can completely re-experience uh, the site. Uh, we had been lucky uh, last year uh, to have our students at a broad range of different sites, so Palazzo Vecchio in Florence, Italy being one of them, looking at the health of uh, some of the frescoes. We're right now working with the Opera del Duomo on uh, recording the baptistry as a base model and studying the cupola uh, damage patterns. Uh, we have uh, student teams in Calabria looking at historic castles and churches. And if you move further, just over the last year, we had uh, uh, quite a few teams in Jordan, uh, Chabed and Nahas, Fayan, and in Petra, 
in many cases, experimenting with, with what we call rescue archaeology. So you get two hours. You get a site. Get whatever you can, right? Because tomorrow that site might not exist anymore, right? Due to development or otherwise. And to really come up with a framework that allows us to balance through a month long, week long expedition to something which might take only uh, a day. And uh, using all of the technology at our disposal, literally creating a rapid response type uh, capability uh, to document what is there and what otherwise cannot be seen. So here are just a couple of examples, and I'll wrap it up uh, in a second. Here's a temple of the winged uh, lion. That was one of the examples where at exactly two hours where it was accessible, I said, okay, let's go ahead, image it, understand uh, the mosaic uh, layouts, uh, get uh, the baseline story out about that site, right? right? Beautiful sites, and uh, last year alone, we had 12 expeditions, all student run, uh, coordinated or supervised by our faculty members, but the students really become our key drivers, our experts, our pride and joy, right? Uh, to drive this forward. I want to show you one example of uh, the airborne imaging site uh, perspective. Do we have audio for this? Gail. The aerial photos clearly reveal the structures of the ancient factory, a fortress and gatehouse, an administrative building, a tower, a temple. The site was enormous. Its massive walls, buildings, and slag heaps covered an area of 25 acres. Up to a size can we very rapidly create a baseline stack of information, in this case through airborne photography of balloons uh, or of drones. Right, that through computation of photography, structure for motion technique, allow us to reconstruct the site, use that as a baseline to anchor everything else, but then also give it to our friend at uh, the National Geographic Society, you know, and so on, uh, for storytelling, right? And that becomes uh, truly powerful. Now, if you look at some of the LiDAR data for that same uh, site that was required terrestrially, right? So the res resolution is better, it's trusted, uh, it might have selected uh, uh, parts missing based on occlusions, uh, but at the end of the day, we can uh, use all of this information when it's combined to tell a story. And so in this case, we have uh, locations of artifact, we have dating results for these artifacts, we can look at different uh, strata, but most of all, uh, we can do all of that interactively, pulling the different data records together to tell the story. And we can do this in our immersive spaces, we can do it on our multi-touch interfaces. Uh, just uh, before I close, uh, finish this off, education was one of the key drivers. Cost prohibitive equipment is always a challenge, right? Photography has been so amazingly uh, powerful over the years, and now with structure for motion, 3D modeling from photography techniques is literally being uh, taken to the next level. This was a survey from a balloon, 400 photos recomputed into a 3D model, which is photorealistic, right? It's not 100% accurate, but it gives us a fairly good a baseline of that particular sites and uh, the burial mounds that existed. But it's using off-the-shelf $400 cameras, right? They are much more readily available. Here's another site that was taken with a handicam, under $20, right, uh, for a particular pit. Uh, 28 pictures went into that to then again reconstruct this 3D model. So taking the approach for cultural heritage preservation, building these archives, and really crowdsourcing it has gotten so much more uh, uh, tangible now. And we were really reminded of the importance just lately. We had a Napa Valley earthquake. Uh, briefly was in the media. Uh, it generated sizable amount of damage, including damaging the Trefasan family vineyard, a 100 plus year old building. For us, of course, that means it's a historic landmark, right? And uh, we really want to understand the state of health. And in this case, in that uh, image, you actually see uh, a couple of uh, heavy uh, 
duty um, excavators uh, pushing up the building to keep in place. It was rapidly leaning over. If you look at this uh, seam here, this is actually the building separated from the adjacent shed uh, due to the seismic event taking place. And the question is, can we very quickly assess the site? Again, rescue archaeology, because tomorrow it might not stand anymore, right? They were waiting for imminent collapse and working very feverishly on reconstruction techniques. So can we archive that site by, while at the same time giving the information to the first responders, the contractors, the structural engineers, to help to preserve it. In this case, we brought out uh, a set of our drones. We spent 20 minutes on the ground flying the site, different elevation bands, acquired 450 images, uploaded it from the field through our mobile devices to our compute cluster in San Diego, had a model back within 15 minutes, and could then do some first baseline assessment. And uh, this model was essentially computed at full resolution over a three or four hour time frame, right? But 20 minutes in the field gives us this data today. Not fully trusted as LIDAR is, but it's pretty amazingly close to it, right? And that's where we hope uh, much more will happen. So I'll stop right here. I'd like to thank all of our supporters. Of course, I'd like to thank the entire SciArc family uh, for really advancing the field in the way it is. And thank you. <laughs>